now entering the borough of Bedford. Pull over here, it's a the store here. This is, uh, yeah. this is Rice's Grocery. It's uh, where we used to come for five cent soda and stuff like that, bring back the, the bottle tops. But up along this river, there's a, there was a mill up here, a mill where the story was slaves had hidden under the mill wheel in the water, which I guess got a little chilly in the wintertime, uh, waiting before, you know, until it was safe to, to head on. There was a town up here called Fishertown. It's still there. It's a Quaker settlement, and that was a haven. But there were, in between, there was a lot of very dangerous territory. There's a story about a schoolhouse. Um, some men found a couple of slaves there uh, hiding and told them that they were going to take care of them, locked them in the schoolhouse, and went and got the bounty hunters and, and came back to you know, take them back south and, and get the, the bounty. So it was, uh, it was one way or the other. It was, it was mixed. It was, uh, most people, I guess, were just sort of indifferent. But there was money to be made from returning slaves and very little thanks for not returning them. So. That's what happened. The Cheney's incident itself, the incident, is the story of 13 slaves who were coming north in the Underground Railroad. And when they reached a point about four miles north of the Mason-Dixon line near a town called Cheney'sville, they were about to be recaptured. At this point, the legend has it that they asked to be shot rather than return to slavery. But the way I've reconstructed it, they killed themselves. And that's something I think is more in line with, you know, historical fact. And my mother, who had gotten involved in local history for various reasons, came across this, this story, tracked it down, and, and called me up and, and told me about it. My mother actually discovered the story a place further, about eight miles further east. Uh, old guy owned a store and told her the story, and she managed to track it down here, you know. And uh, the man who owned who owned the land at that time lived over over here in his farmhouse, and he had never heard the story or, or said he hadn't, um, he didn't remember. But he knew that up there somewhere uh, next to his family graveyard, there were these graves, and nobody knew who they were. They were obviously distinct from, from anything that was there. And he knew that there were black people, slaves buried there, but i never forget the first time we came here, I came here. He got in the car and took us up as far as you could go, and we walked up over the hill. And, and we were, you know, his, he told us that his wife um, had come from Maryland, that her people had owned slaves. Um, and he said, um, I don't know what they were running from. It must have been terrible. What I set out to do is to try to figure out what it was that 13 people, not just one person, but 13 people, would rather die than do. I didn't understand what it was these people m must have been escaping. And you think, well, physical horror, okay. Well, it, for many, many slaves, slavery physically was not that bad. Then you think mental horror. You think of not having any freedom, not being able to make your own decisions. Uh, okay, that's, that's, that's pretty bad, but people have lived through that. And then I began to realize that there was, there was something even more. It was a spiritual deprivation. These were people who came from a kind of religious tradition that we don't share anymore. And in that tradition, uh, ghosts, if we want to call them ghosts, were very real things. They were palpable. One's family and friends, when they died, experienced this physical thing called death. They didn't go anywhere. I mean, they didn't go to heaven. They stayed right around the corner. And, Africans still believe that you see these people, that you talk to them, you have conversations, that they visit you, not in dreams, not like Marley's ghosts, but they're right there. You know, you have the same kind of conversations with them. And you think of what was taken away from these people when they were forced to accept this attitude of pie in the sky when you die and of, of, of you know, starry crowns and going to God's kingdom and everything, and that other concept of hell, which is bizarre. I mean, it's a weird thing for anybody to think of. And what happened was their entire families were taken away from the people were killed literally in, in the minds of the people who were still as we call them alive these other people were killed 
and somebody would come along and say, well, then, that what you've been thinking all along, that, that you're seeing that person, that's really, a, that's really your imagination. That person isn't really there. When they die, they're gone. And that's a very, very terrible thing. It was a terrible kind of deprivation. And I don't know if that's what those people were thinking when they would rather die. But when you realize how deep slavery went, what slavery really meant, not just mental deprivation or even physical pain, but that kind of spiritual destruction, um, it's not hard to understand. It's not hard to understand at all. He knew then that they were watching him, all of them, waiting for him to lead them. It came to him then that there was always escape, always, so long as one did not think too much, so long as one did not calculate too much, so long as one believed. And so he stepped away and stood alone and took the pistol from his belt and held it high so they could all see. For a moment he was not sure that he could lead them, was not sure that they would follow him. But then he saw the woman take her knife from beneath her shawl and hold it high. And then he heard her, heard her singing softly, then louder, heard the others join in, the words of the song growing, rising from the hilltop, floating down the incline, the words sharp and clear against the night. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my God and be free. For a chorus or two or three, the song was loud and strong. And then the song grew weaker the voices that had raised it falling silent, one by one, until at last there was only one voice, a strong soprano voice, carrying the song. And then that voice too fell silent. But the song went on, because the wind had shifted again and was blowing from the west, because now the wind sang. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.